and I'm like the second or third guy left in the house. Um, and I walk out and I get, I step off the, the patio, I get like 10 meters and crack. You know, I hear this, this snap come in. And it sounded like a, a sniper shot had come in. So everybody starts yelling sniper, sniper, sniper. And I thinking, oh my God, you know, cause I heard it behind me and I knew exactly who was on the step. It was Arguello. And I'm like, Arguello's just got capped. This episode is sponsored by Aura. A-U-R-A, which is basically a digital security platform that takes a whole lot of things that you probably pay for separately and puts them into one convenient place. And as a reminder, I don't promote things that I don't use myself, and this is no exception. You all know my background with the agency and keeping people safe online. There are many bad actors out there who wish they had a service like this that would have kept me from finding them. Right? So I would say we start with that as a baseline. But honestly, Aura gives you a whole slew of capabilities that you're probably paying for separately. So I don't even use all of them, quite frankly. But the ones that I use that I wanted to highlight, they've got a built-in VPN so you can browse the web anonymously and securely. They monitor all my info on the dark web, social security numbers, passwords, emails, banking account information. And they actually found some of my info on there. So I had to go and do something about that. They monitor my credit score. Um, they also have a built-in antivirus that's scanning my laptop for, for issues, including how I do all of my work for Combat Story. So all of these things typically would have cost me 50 to 100 bucks separately on different platforms. Aura takes them and puts them all in one place. I pay a flat fee, 12 bucks a month. And you can do the same, keep you and your family safe. So there's a great utility here. You get a 14-day free trial if you use this link, which is aura.com slash combat story. So that's A-U-R-A dot com slash combat story and you help our show and we can keep bringing on some great uh stories from veterans of the military and the intel community who have caught a lot of bad actors who have not been using something like aura and if you're a bad actor listening you should probably go ahead and get something like this too so we don't catch you again thanks everybody check out aura.com slash combat story Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we hear the combat story of Jake Wood, a former University of Wisconsin football player who enlisted in the Marine Corps and fought in both Iraq and Afghanistan as a Marine rifleman and sniper. One of the key moments that led to Jake joining the Marine Corps was the death of Pat Tillman, the legendary NFL safety who walked away from the league and joined the Army after 9-11, eventually being killed while serving as a Ranger in Afghanistan. Jake found himself leading Marines at the very front end of the surge in Iraq and the bloodiest years of the war, stepping into a kinetic environment only weeks after arriving in theater. He was then in Helmand province in Afghanistan as a sniper in an equally kinetic environment. Only two months after leaving the Marine Corps, Jake went on to found the humanitarian support organization Team Rubicon. After hastily organizing what he describes as a motley crew of veterans and doctors to help the people of Haiti after the devastating 2010 earthquake, he recently created another charitable giving business called Groundswell that seeks to democratize philanthropic giving, which we discuss in the episode in addition to Team Rubicon. In 2018, Jake was awarded the Pat Tillman SB for service, bringing his story full circle from Tillman's death that propelled Jake into his own life of service. I hope you enjoyed this unique and insightful interview with someone who played football at the highest level and then selflessly decided to put on a different uniform to help others as much as I did. Jake, thanks for taking the time to share your story with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ryan. So you got a, uh, I would call it a lifetime of service, it looks like, that just doesn't end. There's a part of it that's the Marine Corps, of course, that we'll talk about, but uh, founding companies and giving back to communities. But there's this big part of of your life, I'm sure, that is football. And I thought we'd start a little bit there. Sure. Um, when I was just researching you, Jake, looking at you on a screen, I never would have guessed the position you played back in the day. So you played D1 at the highest level at University of Wisconsin. 
Could you just talk about kind of the influence that football had on your life and share with people the uh, position you played? Yeah, yeah, so sure. So, um, yeah, I played left tackle, offensive tackle in college at Wisconsin, which, um, you know, if Wisconsin's known for one thing from a football program standpoint, it's it's offensive linemen. It is. They, they have some big boys. And it, it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a funny story because I was actually a, a really undersized offensive lineman. I played at like 290 pounds and, and uh, you know, most of the tackles at Wisconsin are 315, 325 and that's definitely where they wanted me, but it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting story. Um, you know, when I was getting recruited in high school, I went, I played high school football in, in Iowa, just down the road from Wisconsin. And, um, you know, I was a, a, you know, good, like all American high school football player. And, um, it was at that time, like it was like 1999, 2000, the spread offense started taking all these conferences by storm. And so it was, you know, you had all these really quick offensive linemen at, at you know, schools like Northwestern and Oregon yeah. and, um, you know, Wisconsin had always played smash mouth football, but Barry Alvarez thought he saw, like he was reading the tea leaves. And so he's like, Oh my God, we're going to have to to compete. We're gonna have to move to the spread offense. So he went out and he recruited a, a whole class of offensive linemen my year that were like these lean, like smart, lean, quick offensive linemen. Interesting. Yeah. So we show up on campus my freshman year and the, you know, they're still playing with these old school Wisconsin O linemen, but they moved to the spread offense that, that fall. And we just get demolished, right? Like we have a, we have our first losing season in a decade and it was coming off back-to-back Rose bowl uh, wins. And I think we went five and seven, my freshman year and Barry, Barry Alvarez was like, fuck that. We're going back <laughs> to smash mouth football. So like, so then like all of a sudden I'm this misfit in the program as we're going, going through. And, um, but it was good. I, I ended up, you know, earning two varsity letters. I, I, uh, I, I backed up uh, a, a hall of fame NFL player for most of my time there, a guy named Joe Thomas, who went on to be a first round draft pick. And, you know, I was, I was really fortunate to play with a guy like Joe and to, to basically carry his water for him, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> But uh, I mean, you asked the question, what did, what did, what influence did football have on me? I think uh, tremendous influence, right? Um, I, anybody that plays team sports, I think will tell you that they helped shape who they are. And football is no exception for me. I playing it at a level that like Wisconsin, you know, yeah. certain, the, the obvious things like, you know, teamwork and discipline and, and hard work, all of those things certainly held true. I think there were some really important lessons that I took away from my time in Madison, one was humility, right? Like I showed up on campus thinking I was going to be an all American or all big 10. I was going to go to the NFL. Like there was no doubt in my mind. And, you know, frankly got humbled. Uh, you know, I never broke the starting lineup. I, you know, was battling injuries. And so just understanding that, um, you know, every once in a while life's going to punch you in the face and you got to figure out how you're going to respond to those things is, was really, was really valuable for me. Um, you know, and another one uh, that I, I think I took away was just the power of, of culture in organizations. Yeah. You know, one of the things that Barry Alvarez loved uh, to tell us was how untalented we were. Um, so, you know, Wisconsin's a top 15 program consistently. Yeah. It goes to a lot of Rose Bowls. It wins a lot of conference championships. Um but when you look at its recruiting classes year over year, it consistently can't crack the top 25 in, in recruiting classes from a talent perspective. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that. But every once in a while, I think it's Sports Illustrated runs this study that that averages like the trailing average recruiting ranking for schools and then compares them against their final actual on the field rankings. And so, you know, the, the inference there is like, how are you translating talent into results? And consistently, Wisconsin has the highest leverage of any program in taking what are what most people would say are like subpar recruiting classes and having elite results on the field. And it's culture, right? And in, in Alvarez, before we'd play big teams like Ohio State or Michigan, which always have you know top 10, top five recruiting classes, he'd say, all you guys wanted to play for Ohio State. Don't lie. You all wanted to play for <laughs> Ohio State. And you didn't get offered a scholarship. So you came here and he's like, so we're not going to beat them with talent because you're not as talented as they are. If you were, you'd be playing for them. Here's how we're going to beat them. And he would talk about the things that we would talk about. We're going to, we're going to out tough them. We're going to outwork them. We're going to out, 
you know, beat them with discipline in our, in our game plan and our commitment to what we do well. And, uh, you know what, like, I think we won three out of four games against Ohio state when I was there. And and I think it was certainly true. So anyway, it, it was just one of those takeaways that, you know, was really foundational for me. And then of course I, I transitioned to the Marine Corps. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a second. And there's, there aren't many organizations that are as culturally, you know, strange as the Marine Corps. Unique. Yeah. Yeah. Unique. And uh, so anyway, I thought it was just really fascinating. Um, but yeah, the lessons were, were almost limitless yeah. in football. So have you, it's funny that you bring up Joe Thomas. Um, we, uh, did you watch him on this show, the Titan games like a year or two ago? Have you heard of this? Oh, Jake, hold on one sec, man. I don't know what's so Jake, you mentioned, uh, Joe Thomas, my family and I, we watched him on the Titan games a year or two yeah. ago, the show that the rock puts on. Yeah. Did you end up watching that? So it's funny. I saw like the commercial uh, and I saw his ugly mug, you know, running around on stage and I, I made sure to record it on our DVR. And I, now that you're saying it, I've, I realize I've never gone back and watched it. But um, it's funny because Joe and I are so good friends. And anytime he's in Los Angeles, like we have dinner and his wife comes out and we'll have dinner and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I always joke like, dude, I know you, nobody knew there was a swimsuit model hiding, hiding underneath that football body. Ah. The entire time. So he, it's he it's wild jacked. to see him, dude. He's he he looks like Adonis. It's crazy. I mean, he was like, always an insane athlete, but you didn't know that he looked like that underneath. You know, the three hundred and twenty pounds he carried. But man, you need to watch it because I think everybody gets humbled. Is the uh, is oh, the, really? the motto here in, yeah. in a in a good way, like yeah. great sport. But sorry, you're, the other thing that you mentioned about Joe Thomas, have you heard The Rock talk about when he's at at Miami and who comes in and displaces him from his position? Uh, I, I know I've heard this story, but I can't remember. Was it like Warren Sapp? It's Sapp. He's yeah, like, yep, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. all American high school. I'm here. I'm at the U. I'm going to go to the pros. Yeah. And then Warren Sapp comes in and he's like, hey, I'm going to take your spot, man. Yeah. yeah. Um. So it's just like for the places you've climbed to since then, I think it just is a great message for people to hear. Like it didn't, it didn't uh, shake your foundation clearly to have Definitely, to do I that. Think, I think uh, I had I had the like it really awesome good fortune of being asked to go back and be a commencement speaker at Wisconsin back in I don't know, 2011. So I, yeah, wow. six years early ago. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, it was the winter commencement speech. <laughs> I think the, I think like the planning committee like forgot like whoever was in charge of finding a speaker forgot or you know because they didn't ask me until like five or six weeks in advance so like clearly yeah clearly they either got forgot it. to go find one or or got turned down um and i just remember telling people kind of that story and i you know just remember saying like hey you you're all graduating here you think you have a plan for life but guess what like life gets a vote you know the universe gets a vote and you're going to, you're going to get punched in the face. You're going to take one on the jaw. You got to figure out how you're going to respond to those things. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, no, nothing in my life has turned out according to plan. So I've stopped planning in life and I'm just kind of like, you know, taking it as it goes. Roll with it. Yeah. Um, so I want to jump to, I think it's correct me if I'm wrong here, Jake, March of 2003, there's a protest on campus when you're, I think a sophomore from what I saw. Um so I want to talk about how, like what happens there, but if you can share anything about your family history, like military, where, if, if that comes in, in any place, or if this is kind of the first time you're confronted with, Hey, this is what the military is doing. And I want to have a say in it. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't say I grew up in a military household. I, um, you know, both my grandfather served, but it was kind of a generation when everybody did. My my dad's dad uh, was an administrative clerk in Europe during World War II, you know, so not on the front lines. Um, you know, he was kind of a nerd. Uh, you say that endearingly. Um, my my mom's father served in the Navy between World War II and Korea, so never, never saw action. Um, you know, my dad joined the Marine Corps during a period of time in his life when I think he was a little listless, but he, he ended up getting discharged a year in for flat feet. So, you know, again, like not, um, you know, not, not a, and it wasn't like, it wasn't something he spoke about. I think frankly, he was a little um, embarrassed by the fact that he'd been discharged for flat feet. So it, it, he didn't, you never would have seen him walking around wearing a Marine Corps or anything, despite 
like he was, he just didn't want to have to talk about it. Right. The yeah. fact that he didn't last. Um, but you know, we grew up, you know, I, I think proud Americans, whatever that means. And, um, and so, yeah, if you fast forward to, to March, 2003, we're invading Iraq. I, I am a, a sophomore on campus. Um, obviously we're already in Afghanistan at that point in time, but you know, that was a pretty non-convert non-controversial, right. And Madison, Wisconsin is a very liberal city. Um, and, uh, so when the Iraq war drum beat started, um, you know, the student body and the broader community was, um, you know, protesting left and right, uh, the, the idea that we were about to go to war. And that was, that was, that was just a really interesting, I, I look back on that experience, um, I think a little wiser, um, yeah. 20 years later, because at the time I was so furious, you know, I was so furious at this notion that we would ever question the decision to go to war. You know, I, I, I think I, I, I accepted everything that we were being told. Uh, how could we possibly be wrong? We're the, you know, we are the, 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 the moral North star of the world. And, you know, if our country tells us we need to go to war, damn it, we're, we're going to war. And how dare you, uh, how dare you stand in the way? And, uh, so supported it early. And yeah, I, again, I think I look back and I, I I have so much more respect for those protesters. Uh, and, I, and I don't know if I go with, you know, if I had a time machine, if I go back, if I would join them, I'm not saying I, I'm not saying that one way or another. I just, I, I, I don't look on them with the disdain I did 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It, and so is that a point for you though, where you say, I'm going to go and, and go into the military after I get out of this place or no? Well, so <clears throat> Joe Thomas still hasn't shown up on campus yet. So okay. I'm still holding so out. You still got hope. different plans. All right. Yeah. So I'm still holding out hope. You know, I, spring football is about to start. Um, the uh, That fall, um, I have the opportunity to compete for the starting job because um, the, the a guy had graduated that had had it for three years. He'd gotten drafted. And, you know, that's just kind of how it went at Wisconsin. Like, you know, the guy ahead of you gets drafted into the NFL, you step in and, and then you wait for your turn to go get drafted. And so I, I thought, you know, that fall, I was going to have a chance to compete for that starting job. Um, Joe Thomas came on campus that fall. Uh, it took me all of three days to realize that I was not oh, going man. to be playing professional football unless I changed positions. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, it was probably later that year. Um when I started to see the writing on the wall, you know, it, now we're, we're full swing in Iraq, 2004, the war starts to get nasty. Um, so I think it's, it's around that time frame where it becomes more and more obvious to me that, Hey, when I graduate, this thing's still going on. Um, I'm not going to the league. What am I going to do? And that's when it started to get real for me. Was it, was it an event or was it just a kind of a buildup over time of watching what was going on over there? Um, yeah, I, I think it was, it, it was, it was both, right. There was certainly a buildup. I was glued to the TV every yeah. day watching, watching it unfold. Um, and, you know, I mean, I kind of skipped it because when we're talking about, you know, my family history, like I, I grew up wanting to join the military, you know, not because I was from a military yeah. family, just because I, it just, what it sounded so cool. Like it seemed like such an awesome, like experience to do. And so, you know, in high school, like I was talking to military recruiters, I got recruited by Annapolis and West Point to play football. I, I went, so I got a nomination for my state uh, Senator uh, who's now 98 years old and still in the Senate, uh, Chuck Grassley. Uh, so that was this whole another can of worm problem. Um, <laughs> and uh and so it was, you know, the moment I was on campus in 2001 and 9-11 happened, you know, that was, that was, that was, that was hard to know that, you know, Hey, like I, I was actually really considering going to the academies to play um, even though I had offers from schools like Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, that, that started to plant a seed for me. Um, then you know, the invasion of Iraq and the, the, what we just spoke about. And then, you know, a year after that invasion of Iraq, you know, the, the moment that I often talk about is kind of the, 
the trigger for me uh, making the commitment to go in was uh, when Pat Tillman was killed on April 24th, 2004. So, you know, I remember it, I was it 20 to the 22nd. It, it was, it was right around, I mean, so it was two days before my sister got married. I was back home in Iowa. We were getting ready for the wedding. Um, and it was a couple of days before my birthday. So I think maybe he was killed on the 22nd and her wedding was on the 24th, but April really 22nd. Yep. Yeah. So he was killed on the 22nd. Um, and, uh, man, what a, what a sobering moment. Um, cause what a, what a special guy first. I think everybody, yeah. everybody acknowledges that. I think the, the thing that was so interesting about him was not that he joined, that was of course powerful and, and so courageous and selfless, but he never gave a single interview, not a single one, right? He didn't make a statement about joining. It was just, you know what? Like I just watched all those firefighters run into those towers and not come back out. I play a game for a living. Like I'm going to go do something of consequence. And, and he said it to himself and not to the public, even though he was a public figure. And that was just so, so powerful. And so when he died, um, you know, regardless of the circumstances under which he died, I, I just, I had this moment where I'm like, who do you want to be, Jake? You know, you, you, you'd held Pat Tillman in such high esteem and he had, uh, you know, the, the conviction, the character to do the, the tough choice, you know, three years prior, what are you going to do? And, and that was, that was the moment that I made the decision. And, uh, so that was the spring of 2004. I, I was concluding my third year on campus. Um, I had five years of eligibility because I redshirted my first year. So I had two seasons left that I could play. And, and I was finally getting to the point where like, all right, like I was, I was by my fifth year, I was going to be playing. They had moved me interior to guard and like there were opportunities, but I just, I knew that like, I wanted to get to the fight. And so I, I went back to campus, uh, spring ball had just concluded. And, uh, I walked into my offensive line coach's office and I'm like, coach, I'm not going to take my fifth year. This will be, this upcoming year is going to be my last. And he looked at me, he's like, Jake, like you're just kind of turning a corner, you know, why now? Like you've put in three years, like what's, what's, and I said, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. And he's like, you're going to fucking what? I'm like, I'm going to join the Marine Corps coach. He's like, whatever. <laughs> you know, he just, he's like, he's like, get out of my office, you know? Wow. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of how he was a curmudgeonly old man. I mean, he was, he was, that just was his attitude. <laughs> but um, from that moment on, I knew that's what I was going to do. And uh, so I, I played that, that senior year, um, that fall. Um, and uh, as soon as we played our last game on January 1st, 2005, uh, it was a bowl game down in Florida, on January 2nd, maybe January 3rd, <laughs> I started training, uh, lost probably 50 pounds in 50 days and was ready to join. Dang. What, uh, how tall are you? You mentioned you were 290. So I'm 6'6". Six, 6'6". Six. Six, six. Okay. So um, as, as we kind of look at the time as you enter the Marine Corps, and we should say um, you ended up getting an ESPY, right? The Pat Tillman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So it kind of comes full circle. In the yeah. Act. Yeah. Remarkably that in 2018. Yeah. Um, as you transition into the Marine Corps, did you just know like, Hey, I want to be, did you go OCS? Um, did, did you know, like, I want to go to the front lines. I want to be in the infantry. Did you give any thought to what else you might've done? Yeah. I, I, you know, like any, um, foolish, uh, chest thumping 22 year old. I said, I want to be on the front lines. I want to be in the infantry, you know? And, um, so it, it was an interesting process because I, you know, I was going to graduate, um, with my college degree. So I was eligible for OCS. Um, and, uh, I, two, two kind of funny stories with that. The first was I, I contacted an, an OSO, an officer selection officer with the Marine Corps and met him on campus. And he, and this is like, right, like the week after my last game. So I'm still like 285. Right. <clears throat> and he's, he's like a Marine captain. He's trim, he's short and, uh, you know, not an ounce of fat on him. And he looks at me and he goes, how fast can you run three miles? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't run further than a hundred yards and. 10 years. And I go, how fast do you need me to run it? He goes, well, 18 is ideal, but you can't be over 20 minutes. I'm like, all right, but by the time, like, oh, okay, that's fine. I can do that. 
I will do that. Right. And uh, then he looks at me, he's like a little skeptical. He's like, how many pull-ups can you do? I'm like, how many do you need me to do? He's like 20. I'm like, well, I can knock out eight dead hang right now at 290 pounds. Once I get down to 245, 20 is not going to be a problem. That's I, no joke. Man. I'm, I'm going to drop Jesus. like two kettlebells worth of weight off. <laughs> and I'll be able to do your 20. And then he asked the, the most consequential uh, question, which he goes, have you had any injuries? And, you know, I, the joke was always, I was made of glass, man. I had my shoulder reconstructed at Wisconsin. My foot got reconstructed my senior year in high school. So I had like pins and anchors all over my body. And, uh, and when I told him that he's like, oh man, he's like, you, you are a mountain of paperwork kid. He goes, I have a line out my door of people that are wanting to be Marine Corps officers. He goes, tell you what, call me when you can run three miles in 20 minutes and knock out 20 pull-ups. Dude. So I was like, all right, man, like this isn't going to work. So I, I I'm like, all right, I'm not, fuck that guy. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I was talking to some people that were coming back from the war and they were like, listen, if you want to lead, if you want to lead men in combat, and I, and I say that because it's just like, what a weird thing to say, you know, when you're 21 or 22 years old. Um, they said, this is not a, this is not a platoon war. It's not a company war. This is a squad war in 2005. And they're like, go be a squad leader. Like if you want, if you want to like be at the point of friction, leading troops, go be a squad leader. I'm like, oh, that's really good advice. So then the decision was, do I go army or Marines? And uh, I'd always, I'd always like gravitated toward the Marines. But at this point in time, the army was doing their 18 x-ray contracts. And that sounded really cool. But I, I went into an army recruiter. They said, uh, is, you know, I said, I'd, I'd love to have an a, a 18 x-ray contract for special forces. Same three questions they asked the that the Marine Corps officer asked, no you know? and it was really the injury thing. They're like, "Man, I we can't get you a guaranteed like pipeline through airborne school with a bad foot and a bad shoulder." He goes, "Why don't I sign you up for the Army Infantry, and then you know you can just like you know try to get into the pipeline yourself." And you're like, "I'm like, you want me to go with the Third Infantry Division? Like, no <laughs> thanks." Like, um, so I walked in the Marine Corps office, said, "Give me an infantry contract." I think it had appeared before my face before I got the words out of my mouth and I signed on the line with them and that was it. Do you, did you have any regrets? You didn't go the OCS route? Like had you run into one. somebody different? Never one. one, never one. No, listen, I, I, I had the pleasure of, of getting to know some amazing Marine Corps officers. I think the Marine Corps officer training program is, I mean, it's just amazing. It's incredible. It's, it's, it's yeah. incredible. It really is. And I, I wonder sometimes how life would have turned out if I'd gone that way. Um, they are just, they are, they are a cut above and it's really incredible, but I, I got exactly what I was bargaining for in my experience with the Marine Corps. And I think, you know, what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. I, I loved, I loved being an NCO. It was such an incredible role. That's, That's exactly awesome. what I wanted. God, the, the fire it must have put under your ass to hear somebody say that. Like you're at a D1 you're NFL prospect. <laughs> yeah, level. exactly. Getting like you think getting, I can't get that? D D1 D1 athlete getting basically straight A's. That I is mean, ridiculous. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't like a rocks for jocks guy either. I had like a three point no, GPA. And you had two majors, right? Yeah, double major. I was like, well, whatever. All right, man. So just before we transition into the fighting side of this, you know, I obviously didn't go through the Marine Corps. I always see these images of training with pugil sticks. Is that what you yeah, call it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, just I'm trying to imagine if we were a whole bunch of guys and there's Jake Wood could played O line at Wisconsin there, six six, whatever you dropped to two fifty. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you just annihilate people in that? Uh, I mean, yes and no. It was funny because I mean, the drill instructors are so sadistic, right? And it, <laughs> it, it just, it's like a total hunger games for them. So they have like, they have this Thunderdome uh, in the pugil stick, like combatant area. And it's basically, there's, there's these two trenches that are covered with cami netting oh. and you run through these trenches, you turn this corner and you end up in like a literal Thunderdome uh, with a couple of like obstacles in it. And it's probably like, I don't know, 25 foot in di diameter. And there's a catwalk around the top. So the drill instructors are just around the top. They're like, make, they're like placing wagers. And so basically what they would do is they'd say, okay, Wood versus the other biggest guy in the platoon, Thunderdome. So you run through, you're, you, and you have to scream, like, show me your war face. You're screaming through this trench and you show up in the Thunderdome and it's like to the death. Uh, and 
And the next time they they might put two guys in the other trench and it's like wood in the in in you know <laughs> it's two on one. Or they might they might have like four guys in the Thunderdome waiting for you. And uh so yeah, I mean I annihilated a few, but I got my ass handed to me because they just they wanted to see how much I could take. Yeah. Um and uh you know, you could you could you could hear him winning the bets and losing the bets on the catwalk. I mean, it was just so surreal, you know. I love it. Oh man, people, that's people so wonder good. why Marines are so weird. Like it's it's pretty obvious. But just stick it through, man. You had to have done uh God, like those one-on-one drills for for 15 years or whatever, playing ball at, well, at I mean, high levels. Well, that's that's the thing. Pull I mean, in the ring and what else what else does football teach you? It teaches you how to get punched in the face, you mm-hmm. know. We had uh, my senior year, right, going back to football briefly, like our defense was the number one defense in the country. And so when you're second string, which I was, you're going against the first team uh, yeah. pretty consistently at the beginning of practice. And you're going at Wisconsin, like they go full speed all the way through the season because it's like, you know, again, we can only win because we're tougher. So I'm just I'm going against an all American defensive end named Erasmus James, who was the number like 15 overall draft pick that year in the NFL. Every single day in practice, I'm smashing my face against this all American. Like, dude, I know how to get punched in the face. <laughs> That's great. Okay. So you get through training. When do you pop out on the other side of the training pipeline and you actually get to a unit, Jake? Kind of what time frame are we in and what's going on with the wars at that time? Yeah. So um the train the whole like Marine Corps training pipeline got pretty backed up. So even though I graduated in May of 2005, I didn't report to boot camp until late October. 13 weeks, I think I graduated boot camp then, like January. Went to the School of Infantry in Camp Pendleton. There was a delay there to get dropped into a a, um, a class of I don't know, maybe a month, and then School of Infantry I think was eight weeks. So I think I got I got sent to my unit around May um, 2006. Okay. And the unit was uh, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines out of 29 Palms. Um, I don't know if you've ever dropped any ordnance out there. but I have uh, not. No. It's a, desolate, it's a desolate uh, place. It's it's the duty station no Marine wants to get. <laughs> um, and uh, I got dropped into 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines who were just rotating back from eight, seven or eight months in Iraq. So they, they're coming back. You know, they... I think they took uh, casualties of, I don't know, eight or nine Marines KIA on that previous deployment. Um, and uh, but not too kinetic. I mean, it was it was a tough deployment. It wasn't like the hardest year that the Marine Corps or a, a battalion had. But we immediately started working up for the next rotation. And, and what happened was that year, 2006, obviously, things got really bad in Iraq. Congress authorized the surge of troops. And in 2007, that surge happened, you know, 100,000 plus more troops sent in and our unit rotated back in um, in January 07. So we were like tip of the spear on that surge sent to Anbar province. Um, And uh, that so I had, you know, maybe seven or eight months of training with my unit before getting sent over. Damn. And what what role were you in? Straight up infantry marine? Yeah, so I was a Marine rifleman, uh, dropped into a Marine rifle squad, you know, rifle platoon. Um, my role, so, you know, it was interesting. Like, I was I was older than a lot of the Marines that had just come back, right? So I, it was this weird dynamic because I was the college educated. I, I got promoted to Lance Corporal because I graduated top of my class in School of Infantry. Yep. So I, I show up, not a private. I'm at least eight inches taller than almost everybody else in the platoon. I'm 50 pounds bigger. I got, I'm wearing Lance Corporal chevrons. Um, and like, listen, I was a good Marine. Like I, I was like tactically proficient even early. And um, so as we're going through this workup, it became, it, it actually created a, an interesting dynamic because very early my platoon commander yeah. saw the potential I had and began putting me in leadership roles. And not a lot of guys liked that. Right. Because suddenly I'm taking leadership roles from guys who've already been overseas. And uh, eventually they and they are putting me in for meritorious corporal boards and stuff over other Marines in the platoon. And again, like it, I had a good relationship with everybody in the platoon, but they also were like, who the hell is this guy? And, you know, it, it didn't it rubbed some people the wrong way. I ended up going overseas um, as a fire team leader. So gotcha. in charge of a four man uh, fire team. Um, and, 
yeah, I had a great squad leader. I was, you know, well prepared for it. Um, but that, that was the role that I yeah. had. If I can just ask briefly before we jump into the combat here, the, um, when you mentioned you were pretty tactically proficient early, it's no surprise, right? Given your track record of where you've performed and, and what you've done, was there anything like anything in particular you do to get schooled up real quick, not just tactics, but to learn playbooks or study and get straight A's. And like, was there anything that you had used along the way? Cause clearly you still got it. You've founded a couple companies here. Um, quick I, learner. What is, yeah, it? I think I'm, I'm thinking I'm a fast learner. I, I can, I, I think I can comprehend subjects pretty quickly. And now I say that I now run a software company. And if the engineers heard me say that they would laugh because I know nothing about software, um, or what they do. So I say that with some caveats, but, um, I think the other thing, so I, I think I have really good comprehension. Like I've had test scores that would indicate that, but it's, I think it's my ability to apply that comprehension in fast moving and dynamic situations. So if you think about what a, you know, what, what happens on a football field at a division one, in a division one football game, you know, you are up at the line of scrimmage. You just were told that, you know, uh, uh, the play selection, the thing about plays, you know, offensive plays at a big 10 school is there's like seven or eight permutations of that play. So it's not just, okay, we're going to run, you know, I saw left 26 power, whatever. Like that's not the way you apply that play based off of the defensive front that you see, there's like six or seven options for how that play then unfolds tactically. And at the line of scrimmage, the offensive line is, is shouting everything that they're seeing, right? They're building situational awareness up and down the line based off of where guys are lining up across from them, how they're seeing the linebackers interact. And so we are literally up until the moment that the ball is snapped, adjusting how we're going to block that scheme according to what we see. And so you have to have this comprehension of the playbook and the application of those, I'll call them tactics for the purpose of a, of a combat yeah. veteran podcast, like the tactics, they're not just like prescriptive. And so I think it's the same thing in, in combat, right? As you're going through something like the school of infantry, or you're building, you're doing a workup, you know, somebody will say like, Oh, well, here's a response to a, a complex ambush. It's like, well, understood, but like a complex ambush has, 75 different varieties and there's no one size fits all approach. So how can you quickly assess what you're facing, adapt to the tactics accordingly. And, and then I think most importantly, communicate that in a frantic situation so that everybody, you know, when the ball is snapped is working in harmony. Like that's, yeah. that's like a part of football that people don't appreciate. That's true. Um, and I think it's a part of combat that people don't appreciate. Yeah. So that's perfect setup then. So, so you're kind of at the front end of the surge, um, kind of gotten what you had, had asked for, for, for lack of a better term there. Can you take us to the first time you're actually in combat, whether it's a mundane patrol or kinetic and what it felt like for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's a number of firsts, right. Um, you know, the first time I landed in Iraq, so, you know, it's January 2007. Yeah, it's the the war is like devolving rapidly. Um, but it's not like it's Ukraine is right now, right? So, um, but nonetheless, like you're dropping in, you're in this C-130, I think it was, and we're flying into Altacatum TQ. And, you know, you do a combat landing. So all of a sudden it just like, you're losing all this altitude and you're like, holy shit, are we under fire? It's like, you, you suddenly, you imagine that you're about to be the first C-130 shot out of the sky by... In, you know, <laughs> non-existent anti-aircraft uh, right. guns and uh, your heart's in your throat. You land and you're like, okay, like, cool, we're here. And then you load up in these seven ton trucks and they're like, you know, they give you the scheme of maneuver. They're like, all right, you know, this, this other battalion picks us up to transport us over to Camp Fallujah from Takatam. And, uh, and it's the, it's the unit that we're going to be ripping with. So they're telling us all their war stories over the previous seven months. You're like, shit, man, these guys have just been slinging it. And, uh, and and we have to drive straight through the city of Fallujah to get from TQ to Camp Fallujah. And, you know, we're, we're two years past the Battle of Fallujah, which was the bloodiest, you know, battle of the war. And so you're thinking like, oh, my God, this is it, man. We're about to drive through Stalingrad. This is going to be wild. And so it's the middle of the night. We're driving, you know, you're, you're 
facing out, um, uh, you know, facing out from the seven ton, you know, eyes only this high above the the steel. And you're just, you think that like hordes of insurgents at any minute are going to jump out of the shadows. And like the guys that, you know, we're ripping with are sitting there just smoking cigarettes. And you're like, man, that guy is cool as a cucumber right there, man. That much. <laughs> Right there, he, that's a hard dude. And you just realize he just he just knows there's no, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's happening. But you know your 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 sphincter is clenched that tight. Just imagining, you know, the hordes of insurgents. Uh-huh. So anyway, that was kind of like my first boots on the ground moment. Yeah. And then from there, it's like a moment of first, right? Like the first time uh, we took uh, mortar fire at our at our combat outpost. And, you know, I had a I had a mortar land probably. 25 meters from where I was. And I for, for the first time hurt, felt that thud, you know, that, that compresses your chest from, from an enemy, uh, an enemy mortar coming in. That was pretty wild. Right. And then, uh, and then you get pretty used to those. Like you don't even, you know, you're not reaching for a flak jacket the next time. Um, but it was about two weeks before we took our first like real contact. Um, we were, uh, we were on QRF, our squad, quick reaction force. And uh, we were working out of a small combat outpost called OP Viking, uh, which was outside of Fallujah in the middle of Anbar, uh, kind of wedged between these two highways. Um, one was the, the major highway was MSR Mobile. And uh, it, it was primarily designed uh, for, for as a counterinsurgency outpost, but to also maintain these presence patrols to help stymie the planting of all these IEDs. So the Marine Corps was big on presence patrols. Like you were patrolling all day, every day. You weren't doing it in vehicles. It was all dismounted. And there was, you know, the army would would do a lot of things just through their um, eagle eye. And, you know, they would just kind of observe. Um, presence patrols was the name of the game for us. Nonetheless, like every once in a while, we would do mounted patrols. And um, so this night uh, we're on QRF and a weapons platoon is out on a mounted patrol and they get one of their Humvees stuck in a muddy field. So it's like kind of the rainy season where we are and uh, they can't get this truck dislodged and the sun's going down and they're worried that they're vulnerable. And so they're just, you know, it, it, it was a kinetic environment. I mean, this was the bloodiest year of the war. So, it, you know, I don't want to make it sound like everything was hunky dory. So they called for QRF to come and help provide defensive perimeter while they figured out how to unstuck, get this, this Humvee unstuck. So we're trying to find them. It was a pretty rural area. The maps were um, inconsistent and we were um, trying to, to reach them. And we made a couple of wrong turns. And finally, like we, we got on the right road. And because it had been a couple hours in the sun, it was like middle of the night. Now it's almost midnight and they were vulnerable. Our squad leader made the decision to run with our headlights on. Um, which normally we'd be driving with NVGs, no headlights for safety reasons. And uh, in order to move faster, he said, let's let's roll with our headlights on. And as we were approaching a bridge, the SOP would normally was to get out, dismount, check under the bridge for IEDs uh, before proceeding to drive across. And um, we made the decision to just just roll forward. And uh, the second that that truck rolled onto the bridge, they detonated an IED and uh, blew, blew that Humvee up. Um, so that was, that was my first real contact. I was in the third vehicle. Um, and you know, it's wild, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, as it's happening, the thing about like com- these combat situations, the first time you experience them, because they're so abnormal, your mind doesn't even really know how to process what it's seeing. And so I remember seeing like that truck, like glow orange and seeing the smoke and were you on MVGs, Jake, at the time, or no? No, I, was, no, I wasn't. You guys had headlights. Okay. Yeah, we had headlights, so I, I, I wasn't, and um, and I didn't hear the explosion. And I, my first reaction was that they just blew their engine, like, like, like not even an IED, like the engine, because these, I mean, these are Marine Corps Humvees, right? Like, we didn't get the, the slick stuff the Army had. <laughs> these were hand me downs, and they <laughs> and they never worked, right? Yeah. So I was like, God damn it, their their engine blew. And then my turret gunner dropped down. He's like, they hit, fuck, they just hit a bomb. They just hit a roadside bomb. And I remember opening my Humvee door and I still just remember the sensation of being able to feel that heat wave from the blast hit my face and just the smell of cordite in the air. Um, so we ended up, so I, I grabbed a medic and we, we hastily set up the remaining trucks to have some areas of covering fire. 
and I ran and, and a, a couple of things happened. I, I watched my squad leader. Um, he was trapped in the vehicle because his door couldn't open from the inside again, like hand-me-downs. So Matt, he's inside, he's trapped inside a burning Humvee and he can't open his, what's probably a 1000 pound armored door. And so this, this Marines yanking on it from the outside, finally gets him out. And, uh, he, he tumbles out. He, he runs back to me, uh, stomps back to me. He's, uh, got one of his legs is shredded. It's amazing that he was able to walk on it. All he does is ask for a radio because he's only concerned about, you know, getting his guys out of there. I grab a medic. I go. And as I get there, they're pulling the driver out of the burning. And this thing is like, I mean, this thing is like burning. Um, they pull the driver out. And right as I arrive, the the bridge is on fire. Um, and eventually the, the, the fire gets so bad on the bridge that we get cut off from the rest of the squad. So I'm, I'm there with a medic. And the survivors of the truck and the driver was dead. He was, um, you know, died instantly. And so all night we're waiting there for a couple hours. We can talk across this canal back to the rest of our squad, but we have no radios on our side. Our heavy weapons got melted in the truck and we have no idea what's happening. But again, like in these, these first moments, you imagine this is going to turn into a complex attack. So like we're expecting like what's the follow on attack to this this bomb. And so we're setting up a perimeter on our side of the canal. Um, I'm the only guy that's not like really wounded because the other guys have concussed. They have a little bit of shrapnel, but they're not, they're not too bad. And it's me and the medic and, uh, and, and one other team leader. And, uh, you know, we just, we basically set up a perimeter around the body of our friend and we waited. Eventually, you know, you guys picked us up some army, um, army helicopters came in, landed and, took us away, but you know, that was my welcome, my real welcome to Iraq moment. Dang. How, um, I guess when you got back and situated, what was going through your mind after that? Cause that's early on, huh? I mean, you hadn't been in country that long. Yes. Yeah, so this is a couple two weeks. weeks. Yeah. This is two weeks in this February 18th, uh, two weeks after we started combat patrols, February 18th, uh, 2007. We got, so we got, we got on the helicopter cause we, we didn't know what to do. Um, we got on the helicopter that they, they took us in the body of, of Blake to TQ. So they, you know, not back to like our base, it like caused all this chaos because there weren't like, there, there wasn't like a great accounting of like what the wounded were on our side of the canal. So like it got reported back that like, that I was all screwed up. So like my bunk mates thought that I was like, like the reports, I was badly burned. I was, I got flown to TQ in a medevac. So it, it was like 48 hours before it got sorted out that we were like, the rest of the guys were alive. Like nobody was really injured and concussions didn't exist back then. Like TBI wasn't a thing. So the guys that like really got rattled, like, you know, they, they were like, you know, shake it off. Yeah. Got a pat on the back and you know, Hey kid, get back out there. Um, but yeah, it was, it was surreal. Um, and it, it was strange because, um, because we went to Altacottam, I mean, my, 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 uh, I was wearing a flight suit was, was what the uniform was out then because we needed the Nomex flight suits because all the, the IEDs, they were putting the fuel enhanced IEDs out there. So we needed the flame retardant flight suit. So I'm, I'm walking around TQ. My flight suit is covered in blood from pulling Blake out. And I can't get a, I can't get a spare one. Like, you know, it's like covered in blood and grease and all uh. this stuff, mud, cause it was a muddy field. And, uh, and I'm getting yelled at by all these, these first sergeants and master sergeants in the rear. I don't even have a cover, right? And the Marine Corps is big on never being outside without a hat on, a cover on. I don't, I was, cause I, all I had was my Kevlar. And I just remember walking around for like a day and a half before they were able to get us back to OP Viking and just getting yelled at every 50 meters by some Marine in the rear. And I was just like, fuck you, man. Do you? Yeah. It was, it was just a, it was just a really strange experience. You God. Know? Did, um, was there any, a lot of the guys I talked to, they, they kind of go through an event like that and they might think to themselves, all right, maybe I have to wrap my head around the fact that I might not make it out of this place because it happens early on. Did that ever kind of cross your mind just so that you could focus on what you were doing and not like think too much about home and what might happen next? Oh, a thousand percent. I mean, you know, in both Iraq and later in Afghanistan, you know, the next four weeks or five weeks in Iraq, we 
our platoon and our broader company at OP Viking took like, I don't know, a half dozen more KIAs. And there was this enemy sniper in the in the region that uh shot one of my um boot camp classmates through the through the head while he was walking on patrol. One of one of the guys in my platoon got shoot, shot through the throat while we were doing a a raid in the market three weeks after the IED attack, shot another guy in the gut, uh, changing guard, shot a guy off our HESCO barriers on the, um, at OP Vike. I mean, it was like this, like this guy was like legit prolific and was just, I mean, he was just terrorizing us. And so, you know, you see this enemy sniper, like knocking guys off with headshots while they're walking on a dismounted patrol. And you're like every, I mean, and we were, I was patrolling two times a day. You don't, I mean, that goes through your head. I guess that's a terrible pun. Um, you know, that's going through your head the whole yeah. time. And uh, yeah, you have to settle into this idea that like, nah, man, at least I won't feel it. Like that's what you, that's, that's a really dark place to go. Like, yeah, at least I won't feel it. Yeah. It'll suck for the guys that have to carry my 250 pound body back. Right. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we haven't talked about Afghanistan, but when, and I'm sure we will, but I was, uh, we were in Sangin in Helmand Valley, which was probably the most kinetic patch of dirt on earth when we were there. And um, we lost dozens of limbs, like every week. I mean, I, I, I don't even know if there's a good accounting of how many limbs got lost on that tour. Um, I mean, I would say at least, I, I would guess three dozen amputees. And th this is from IED. This is and this is specifically Glasses. from um uh yeah IEDs for dismounted patrols yeah so this, this you know uh, most of the IEDs in Iraq were were targeting like vehicles and convoys and stuff this was like purely like all the dismounted patrols and the way they would plant these and so I was in a sniper team in Afghanistan and I was the point man which like meant that I was out front and there were like two options for finding an IED and that was like my responsibility I either saw it which we only patrolled at night so good luck seeing a night you know a you know, a landmine uh, at night or I step on it. Right. And it did not get, it did not take long to get into a state of mind where you're like, yeah, I'm not coming home at least not with all my parts. Yeah. You know, and, and some people have said that's even worse. The idea of losing a limb and coming back can be even worse. Well, and what's, what's here's, I mean, this, that's an interesting, um, you, what you end up doing is you just make, you make deals with all your platoon mates, right? Like, do you, do you either save me or don't save me? And it's like a dark conversation to have, but it's it's like, it's agreed to in blood, you know, where you say, hey, listen, man, if it's one leg, I'll take it. If it's two legs above the knee, like pump me with morphine, let me go quietly. Um, you know, if my dick gets blown off, you know, talk to me about Definitely. it and we'll make a decision on the fly. You know, I mean, like, and everybody, everybody, it's it's kind of like, uh, you know, end of life, um, yeah you know, uh, uh, agreements that you make, like when you have, you know, uh, whatever that's called. Um, yeah. With a will, with your spouse. Yeah. Healthcare power of attorney. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's exactly what you have. And I mean, the, the way you do it is you, you know, you just say, Hey, just give me like eight sterets of, of morphine. And, uh, you know, cause that'll just stop your heart and it'll be easy. Right. We had a guy, um, probably four or five months after the, that IED. So this is late into our tour in Iraq. And I mean, this is again, triangle of death in the Anbar province during the bloodiest year of the war. So like, that's, you know, kind of how this tour went. And there was one night, you know, you know, the point of the story is, is how bad some of these injuries can be. Um, there was one night where we got a report that Al Qaeda had been using a safe house a couple hundred meters from where we were. We were out in this rural, rural area called the Zidon. Um, outside of Fallujah. And so we we were sent out in a patrol to go check out the safe house. Now we knew like the report was Al Qaeda had been using it. They weren't there anymore. So we weren't like expecting a fight. Um, and uh, we patrolled up to it. And sure enough, like it was very clear that Al Qaeda had been there. Um, you know, uh, uh, big 12-7 um, casings all over the floor, like from an anti-aircraft gun, like crazy stuff. I and mean, there were rumors that they had these big heavy machine guns in the area, like and this was the first validation of it, a lot of food, a lot of other stuff. So we're taking photos of it so we can pass it up to the Intel shop. And we stay there for 45 minutes and decide, okay, let's, let's move on. 
we're walking out and, uh, you know, as our protocol, because of both the landmines and the snipers, we walk out of the front door one at a time and you wait for the guy to get 15, 20 meters of dispersion before the next guy goes out. So we've got 13 Marines walking out of this house. Eventually it's a, you know, it's a patrol, it's a hundred meters long. And I'm like the second or third guy left in the house. Um, and I walk out and I get, I step off the the patio. I get like 10 meters and crack. You know, I hear this this snap come in. And it sounded like a, a sniper shot had come in. So everybody starts yelling, sniper, sniper, sniper. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. You know, because I heard it behind me. And, and I knew exactly who was on the step. It was Arguello. And I'm like, Arguello's just got fucking capped. And we hit the deck. And we're looking around. And um, I see Arguello standing right there on the patio. And he's holding his rifle here. And there's smoke. There's dust coming up from the, the ground next to him. So I'm like, he ended his no, rifle. In no, no way. Deck. And in the Marine Corps, like if you negligently discharge your weapon, like you're done, like good luck. You're going to, you're going to lose rank. You're going to, they're going to take your weapon away. So I start just like, oh, well, I can't. And, he, and he looks at me, he goes, Corporal Wood, I, I did not, I, I didn't fire. And, and then I, it like dawned on me, he had stepped on an IED. So we crawl back to him. And we, he was standing on a booby trap that we, we called anal beads. They, 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 they were called anal beads or Christmas tree lights. So basically Al Qaeda started using this booby trap where they would take copper wires and they would take a garden hose and they'd cut this garden hose up into like tiny pieces. And they'd put the copper wires through the, the top and bottom on the inside of the, of the, of the garden hose. And so when you, and then they would spray paint it all gray. So they would look like gravel. And then when you stepped on that piece of garden hose, it would collapse and, and connect the, the, the wires. And so they could, they could fling these, these anal beads across the roads really quickly. And it created this really deadly, hard yeah. to, hard to see. And so we see that he's standing on these and we t- don't move, don't move. We go over, we dust off right next to the, 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 the concrete. And there's a artillery shell right there. And the blasting cap had gone off inside the artillery shell, but not sympathetically detonated the RD. So like luckiest moment of our lives, he would have been missed. I would have been toast and probably one or two other guys would have been wounded. And so it's like the luckiest moment of our lives. We call some engineers. We had these engineers attached to us. They come over. They're like, okay, yeah, we know exactly what happened. They weren't qualified to like dismantle it. So we have to call EOD techs in. EOD tech, this is like the busiest year of an, any EO tech's life. And so they're like, dude, it's going to be six hours. So we basically pull security on this IED for six hours. Now that the sun's down, EOD finally shows up. We go over to link up with the EOD. They're across this canal. We walk up to this footbridge and they're coming across the footbridge. We're walking up to it. And right at that moment, they look down and there's a second IED right at the base of that footbridge. So they're like, boom, luckily EOD was there. So we back up. They... They control debt that that uh, IED at the base of the footbridge. We're like, man, luckiest night of our lives. Like the first one didn't work. Found the second one. Great. And uh, we're finally walking up to high five EOD. And one of our engineers steps on a third one and loses both his legs, one of his arms, and his testicles get ripped right out of his scrotum. And his lung, and his lung collapses. And uh, it was the most horrific thing I've ever seen in my entire life. You know, we end up strapping them, uh, strapping tourniquets on both his legs, strap a tourniquet on his arm. Somebody, sh- you know, shoves a needle in his chest, um, you know, decom- uh, decompresses his lung. And, uh, and I remember this moment where I look down, I see his testicles laying in the dirt and, uh, you know, that's not in the manual. Right. So I just scoop him up and put him on his stomach. And remarkably an army black Hawk helicopter showed up in like, I don't know, six minutes. I mean, who knows? It might've been 15 or 20. I have no idea, but it was like, we, we put him on this stretcher. We put him on that bird and we just, you know, kind of assume he's dead. And, and frankly, like we'd stuck him with so much morphine. We kind of I mean, we were kind of taking that approach of like, let's just ease this for him. 
we didn't learn for two weeks that dude was alive. Um, and it's, and it's an amazing story because he's, he's alive today and he plays Paralympic ice hockey. That's awesome. Drags himself around on a sled, um, slaps a stick around with his one arm. Um, and he's got kids. Wow. So, Man. yeah. Um, I, I interviewed, I don't know if you know, Derek Herrera. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I know, you know him. Yeah. Similar. So uh, just before we kind of jump to Afghanistan here on this topic, as you come out of nights like that, from that first kind of um, contact you're in to a, an event like that, what do you tell your family? Like in your mind, you're taught in your mind, you're making your mind up like, Hey, I might not make it back. I got to make things okay and you're talking to your guys about like hey if i lose both my legs just let me go peacefully what if anything did you do to tell your family what was going on and some some people it's nothing so i was pretty transparent with my family early and then that transparency started to wane you know um and i i don't know if there's a right answer or a wrong answer you know you want to you want them to I don't know. I mean, you kind of want them to have a window into what's happening at the same time. Like there's definitely the argument that, Hey, ignorance is bliss. I'm not sure what's right, what's wrong, but, um, I definitely did not share that story. Right. Yeah. Man. Um, so you mentioned the transition to being a sniper heard that it's an incredibly difficult school, probably the best sniper program that there is for the Marine Corps. Um, how hard was that for you getting through that course compared to some of the other training you'd been through, including D1 football? Yeah, the hardest thing I've ever done. And it didn't help that I was a terrible shooter. Um, you know, I, I I mean, listen, I was a I was an average shot uh, as a rifleman. I won't say, you know, we had some guys who were just crack shots. You know, you could tell they'd been shooting squirrels their whole life. Yeah. Um, I was not that. And um but most people have this misconception that sniper school is just all about shooting. The reality is like, once you get there, they can teach anybody to shoot. Like, honestly, almost nobody fails for shooting. And, it, it, but, well, I shouldn't say that. Like we started with probably 34 Marines, I think from all across the Marine Corps, we graduated, I think 14 of the original 34. Wow. And of the 20 that dropped, I'd say maybe only four or five, maybe six dropped for shooting. Right. Everybody else is dropping for you know, stalking, they, they got a lot of guys get dropped for that. And a lot of it's just the physical stuff. I think people really underappreciate how physical sniper school was or is. It was brutal. And what they're really trying to do is they're trying to, they're trying to see who is going to be able to make tactically sound decisions under the most extreme duress imaginable. And not just tactically sound, but like, uh, also be able to demonstrate good judgment because the decisions that they have to make are like, do I, does this person die or not? And those are, those are really consequential decisions. And so you want somebody that's in the right frame of mind, even in the worst, you know, on lack of sleep, exhausted, lacking food, are they still going to make the right choice? Are they still going to be a good teammate in that moment? Um, that's really what they're looking for as much as anything. So as you fast forward to your time in Afghanistan, you're there as a sniper, as you mentioned, you know, you go out in these small teams, um, is there, is there an operation, a moment, an experience you have there as you're having to kind of use this training that you, you learned as a sniper and employ it for the first time or a more difficult time when you're there? Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was a tough operating environment. We were, I mentioned earlier, we were in the city of Sangin in the Helmand Valley. Um, we had two sniper teams supporting about two or three platoons of Marines and about two or three platoons of British uh, Royal Ranger regiment guys. And uh, so I don't know, maybe like 300 guys in the entire city of Sangin. And we were outnumbered by the Taliban. I mean, like, I mean, make no mistake. It was crazy. It was Indian country. And like two years later, the Marine Corps could barely hold that city with two battalions. Um, and I, and I wouldn't even say we were holding it. We were, I mean, we were basically just like holding on, trying not to lose it. Um and, uh, and so that environment was really hard for a sniper. So even though there, there were a lot of Taliban, like there was, there was no such thing as being able to run, uh, uh, a mission without the enemy knowing where you were, right? Like the moment we left our operating base, there was a 50% chance 
even though we were sneaking out of our own base, like sneaking out over the walls, like we were like, like we were getting really creative to just escape our own operating base. Um, there was a 50% chance we were being followed from the moment we left. So then you're trying to get creative with all the ways that you can play these cat and mouse games as you're trying to move out into the countryside, circle back on somebody that might be following you, all that stuff. It was, it was wild. Um, but it certainly meant that it was hard to run like the traditional multi-day sniper missions where you're really out there like observing and waiting for someone to do something dumb. I mean, we were almost operating more as a, oh, man, I don't even know. Like we'd go out each night and just try to kick a hornet's nest and see if we could get somebody to come out and get in a gunfight. And then we'd go back by morning, most most nights. Just as a small <clears throat> sniper team, not like as a forward element of a, of another six, unit? No, six man team. There were there were times when we go out when they were running like company sized ops, uh, which they would do frequently. They would go take a, like a company sized element, sweep through an outer uh, village, and we would we would always insert in advance the night before. So you know between midnight and sunrise, we'd go out. We'd we'd usually try to get on the other side of that AO so that we're observing back through the 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 combat area towards the Marines coming. So that made that a little bit more challenging, but, um, and we had some success doing that. You know, there were a couple of ops where, you know, we were able to get into good positions and take like really, really good shots on, on Taliban combat combatants and actually like shape battlefields in a traditional sense. Um, oh, there was a story I wanted to tell when you asked, oh, it, it was, I was reminded of it. So one of the things we had, so the, the Taliban would use these unencrypted radios, um, uh, these ICOMs, they were called. And uh, and they knew they were unencrypted and they knew that our <clears throat> our signals uh, intel people could intercept everything that they were saying. So Taliban's not dumb. They know that they have to put as much uh, bullshit out as any sort of real operational planning. So it was pretty funny because those guys would be on the ICOM, you know, if we'd be sitting at our, our main base in, in the center of Sangin. You'd be like, oh, we have the district center surrounded with 400 Mujahideen attack on, you know, our command and, you know, and, and pretend like they're about to go try to overrun us. And we, everybody would just laugh. And frankly, our, our interpreters would, would call back on an ICOM and say like, hey, nice one, Muhammad. We'll see you. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow, you son of a bitch. Um, and uh, but one night, every once in a while, the, the, the unit that um, did all the, the intercepting and translating was called Profit. And every once in a while, Prophet would call and they'd say like, actually, hey, we've got something that we, we think is valid. <clears throat> I remember one night, you know, I was, again, walking point and uh, we're middle of the night. We think we've like, hey, nobody knows where we are. Like, we're oh, this is going to be a good one. This tonight's the night. Right. And uh, I crossed this small footbridge <clears throat> and on my inner squad radio, our our radio operator, he's like, hey, Wood, hold up. I'm like, OK, you know, take a knee. And, uh, Hey, what is it? He goes, prophet just called on the radio. So they intercepted some chatter that they think is notable. I'm like, all right, what is it? He goes, they say they're following a six man sniper team and that the lead guy just crossed a footbridge. <laughs> oh, fuck. You know, I'm sitting here. I'm like, I'm like, and suddenly like, you know, your hair just stands up. You're looking, you, you hear every sound. Right. And you're just waiting for that moment when, the lighting, you know, the, 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 the muzzle flashes start. And, uh, man, we, we got out of there as fat. I mean, like we like ran, I mean, we were running back and we were not sticking around for that gunfight. Um, and nothing happened. It was like one of those nights where you, you, you don't know like what could have happened, like how bad that could have been. Uh, but I, I'll just never forget that moment. It was so explicit, <laughs> the description of what they just saw. And I'm like, all right, that's not bullshit. <laughs> yeah. And you're not, you're not a small person either. I'm sure it's like, you know, no. not hard to, to pick yeah. up. Yeah. Um, how, um, how difficult was it to have to take a shot as a snow? And I'm not trying to get gory or anything here, but just like, it's, it's probably, hard to be more intimate than looking through a scope at a target and, and pulling the trigger. Did it, was it difficult for you to do? Um, did you have to change your mindset at all? Or is that just kind of like reinforced through the training as you do that? <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, I think that guys do a lot to try to desensitize themselves, um, to those moments. Like one of the things like snipers start doing is they don't, they don't talk about people, right? Like they talk about, 
like their whole language changes. They talk about targets. They never refer to anyone in any sort of like humanistic way. Uh, you know, you don't want to kill humans. You want to take down, you got, you want to whack tangos or eliminate targets or like, so you, I think there's all these subtle things, whether they're happening implicitly or explicitly um, that start to make those moments a little bit easier. Um, you know, most of the, most of the shooting we were doing was in the middle of a, a fight though. Right. Like I, I mean, we took very few shots where it was like someone totally unsuspecting. Yeah. Um, it happened. And I think that those were, you know, and, and those were some of our other shooters. I think that, yeah, and I never asked them the question, but I could imagine how that was probably harder, but man, when, when you're in a, like a two way gun battle and it's your dynamic, that, yeah, it's pretty easy to put a Chevron on somebody. Um, you know, just, it, it becomes, um, it, it's just you or them, you know? Yeah. Um, so just mindful of time here, cause I want to get to Rubicon and, and how that starts. Um, but I also, it, is there any other event in Afghanistan that w was like a strong lesson for you, whether it was leadership or just overcoming adversity that, that you recall or that um, you draw back on maybe? Well, I, I think that the only, the only other event that I'd mentioned, it's probably a good segue towards, you know, what came next was, you know, later in our deployment, Taliban um, launched an attack in the market, which was about a mile from our forward operating base. And um, we could hear the attack happening. We knew there weren't any Marine elements in the area. So like, we kind of didn't know what was going on. Then all these civilian casualties started pouring into the um, our Ford operating base, and, and a lot of them were kids. And so, you know, I I had a you know decent medical training, even though I wasn't a medic or a corpsman. And uh, so, me and another guy from our team, we grab a kid on a stretcher and we we start taking him down to the HLZ uh, to pre prepare for a medevac. And so, you know, I'm just sitting there working on this kid with a gunshot wound in his leg, and I'm just and I see all these other kids around me that are wounded, shot up. Um, and, uh, that was the moment where I'm like, all right, I, I can't do this for the rest of my life. Um, some people can, and we need guys like that. I know guys like that. It doesn't mean that they're like bad people or they got like a screw loose. It doesn't mean that at all. I just, it was not who I could be. So, and, it, and I, I think my fear was more, I actually think the fear was I could be that person and I don't want to be that person. So it was more of a conscious choice. Like before I slip into thinking that this is a normal existence, I want to get out. Yeah. Damn. Um, was it difficult to transition out? Because I would imagine like kind of the way you came in, high flyer, getting to sniper school probably is not something everybody gets to do. Um, I'm assuming that it was hand selection there. Yeah. Competitive. You make it through this deployment. Um, you probably have a really high trajectory. Like was it tough to separate or, or was that – event enough to say like, all right, yeah, I got to get out of here. Nobody's holding me back. I mean, like if I had stayed in like the only avenues for me that would have been, a, a um, worth pursuing was, was MARSOC, which is that was at the time, the new Marine special operations command. Um, and I hate water. So <laughs> I'm like, ah, you know what? I'm going to, you know, I, I probably, it's probably what I would have done. I would have had to overcome it. Um, to, to try to go into MARSOC, but, um, you know, I, 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 I didn't want to stick around and go back to the infantry units. So you, yeah. you snipers, like you can't stay operational as a sniper for long. I maybe had four more years as a sniper before I would have had to, uh, I would have ranked out. Um, so, I mean, it, it wasn't hard in that way. What was hard was knowing that a lot of the guys I served with that I loved very dearly were staying in. Yeah. You know, that was so awesome. hard. So, so as you transition out, then it, what, what are you around like 2010 at yeah, that point? The, the end of 09. Yeah. Okay. And, and then could you take us through the, where team Rubicon comes from? Cause this is service like from the, for the core, it seems like. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I thought my time serving was over. I, I wanted to go back and get my MBA. Well, so contextually it's 2009, right? The global economy's melted down. The labor market's the worst it's ever been. Not a great time to be getting out of the Marine Corps without a plan. That's also when I got out of the Army. So like I I, <laughs> I can uh, sympathize with you. Yeah. yeah. And so I, you know, I wanted to do something entrepreneurial, but like I had no practical work experience whatsoever as a sniper. So 
you know, the plan was to go spend two years, get my MBA, um, decompress a little bit, try to wait out the the recession, and then kind of launch into what was next. So I, I took the GMAT exam, started to apply to business schools, and uh, in January 2010, so this is 60 days after I separate from the Marine Corps, uh, I wait for those grad school application decisions to come back and the Haiti earthquake happens. And that's really when Team Rubicon begins. I sat there and watched the Haiti earthquake unfold for the full day and finally decided, hey, I want to I want to help. I want to do what I can. I uh, I uh, tried calling uh, the Red Cross and, and told them, you know, kind of my background and said, hey, I'd love to go down and help your team run op- operations on the ground. And and told him I I do it for free and I'm available for six months. Just let me know how I can be helpful, but I'm really good in bad situations. They're like, no, why don't you just text us $10 and let the pros handle it. And uh, that was, that was, uh, you can imagine like how cocky I was having just come back from two combat deployments. Like it's not what I wanted to hear. Um, So I called a bunch of Marines I served with and um, you know, we, we ended up getting a team of doctors and veterans together and, and, I mean, it was like this totally motley crew um, that we we took down. We got to Haiti about four days after the earthquake. And, and before I go any further, so fast forward 12 or 11, you know, 11, 12, 13 years, I run a global humanitarian organization. And if some idiot called me after the Haiti earthquake and told me how special he was and that I really needed him to go help run operations on the ground, I'd tell him to text me $10 too. <laughs> so I do, not, do not begrudge oh, that woman on the phone one bit. Um, it's just, it's just a part of the story, you know, that's great. So can you give us a little flavor? Like the Motley crew, I get it. You arrive, like, what is the plan when you guys get there? Cause I'm sure it's like, all right, who's coming with me? All right, we got them. We're on the ground. Like what happens next, man? It was wild. We had basically, um, just drag bags and drag bags full of medical supplies, but, but nothing that special. Right. I mean, like this is a lot of this is like, tourniquets and bandages and splints and, and, um, some like antiseptics and stuff like that. But it's not like we were carrying down there, like controlled narcotics or surgical gear. We end up getting our hands on a lot of that stuff, but the plan was just to go down there, spend like four or five days until our supplies ran out, help as many people as we could and, and, and come back. And we end up, you know, in total team, what became known as team Rubicon was down there for, I think 20 days. Um, we had like 60 or 75 people rotate through as part of the team. And again, like it was who, who were these six? I don't even know. I honestly, I don't even know who half of these people to this day are or were, but we'd have, we'd be down there. We ended up working out of this compound run by Jesuits, um, like these Catholic missionaries. It was walled. It was really secure. It had a freshwater well. So it was like a great place to, to base operations out of. And there was like, there were nights where somebody would like come and knock on the door and it was like this metal gate and uh, we'd open it and, you know, be like this white dude and you know, like in Haiti, like a white dude st- sticks out of this white guy, face would pop in the, the door and I'd be like, who are you? And he's like, oh, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I'm a neurosurgeon in Portland. I'm looking for Team Rubicon. But okay, how'd you hear about it? He said, oh, I saw, I heard, you know, you talking on the radio and I wanted to come. I brought two of my nurses with me. I look over his shoulder. There's two nurses back there. I'm like, we're not doing brain surgery. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, can you stitch? He's like, yeah, I can stitch. I'm like, all right, you, you got a job. All right. So, I mean, that's the type of stuff that was happening though. Um, so it just snowballed. And, and, you know, I guess long story short, I, 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 pretty much never go to business school. We I start running team Rubicon full time and I, I ran it full time until last year. Um, so for 11 and a half years, Jake, where's the, like the inkling where you're like, this could be something that I do longer term. How quickly does that happen when you're on the ground there? Uh, you know, me and me and uh, a guy named Will were starting to have that conversation probably two or three days in, um, you know, we were seeing so much um, dysfunction with these other organizations. And to be fair, like this is the worst catastrophe, you know, in a hundred years in a country that has no infrastructure um, is corrupt to begin with. And I mean, this was, this was like the most Armageddon scenario you can really imagine in a disaster zone. So, you know, that dysfunction was inherently natural, but I thought, I think we saw a lot of that dysfunction was leading to paralysis and indecision. And so the way that those, that dysfunction was manifesting itself was really catastrophic in terms of, the lives that were lost due to it, 
and and for us that was really frustrating. And you know, I think we we probably had too high of an opinion of ourselves. You know, I think we we thought we had all the answers and and you know we could solve all the world's problems. And listen, we were super naive. Um, but I think we were onto something, right? This idea of of taking that military mindset, that combat operational mindset, without the combat, and applying it in these humanitarian circumstances. I think what we've proven over the last decade is that there's there's something there, and we've built, I think, one of the best disaster and humanitarian response organizations in the world off that that original thesis. It just wasn't as easy and obvious as we thought. I think at the time, back in January 2010. I think that's how startups begin, right? Like if you knew <laughs> how hard it was going to be, you probably wouldn't yeah. even dream of undertaking it. And then where does the name Rubicon come from? Yeah. So as we were on our way down uh, to Haiti, um, getting into Haiti was part of the challenge, right? So the airport was shut down. There was only military and, and humanitarian flights allowed in. U.S. Air Force was actually running that. So we chose to fly into the Dominican Republic and rally up there. And then it was like this you know, planes, trains, and automobiles to the Haitian border. And we were uncertain whether or not the border would even be open when we got there. And then we were trying to figure out if we, you know, how could we circumvent the border uh, checkpoints and just like walk across. And basically there was this body of water right at the border checkpoint that we went to called Himani. And, uh, you know, if you'll recall the historical context of the Rubicon River and Julius Caesar crossing it and that being the point of no return, we saw that like, hey, if we get to that point, at the border and we're you know that's like our point of no return that's where we know like all right we we can get in and we're like going to commit to this mission so we called that small team team rubicon and um you know just stuck it's cool that's really cool and then now you got groundswell right so you didn't have enough going on before so you're like let me just do something else where does this where is it born out of yeah and, so one of the, and if you could tell people what groundswell does yeah so um what we're building at groundswell is a a, a social impact benefit for modern companies. Basically, what we're trying to do is make charitable giving a component for how it, companies compensate their employees. And, and part of how we do that is we've 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 built a platform that democratizes access to this charitable giving fund called the Donor Advised Fund. And historically, like only really rich people have had access to them. And so the reason why I came up with this idea, one of the things, you know, over 11 years at Team Rubicon, we raised about $300 million in charitable giving. It's a lot of money. And I raised a lot of it from companies. We raised a lot of it from billionaires. And we raised a lot of it from grassroots donors across the country. And there were two things that I, I came to realize after raising $300 million. One, the person, the widow in Kansas who's giving away $25 a month out of her social security check is giving a more meaningful portion of her income than a billionaire who just cut us a $250,000 check. And yet she doesn't have access to the same giving tools that, that billionaire does. And to me, that was just never fair. And there's no reason that she shouldn't have access to those giving tools. So part of what we're doing is democratizing access to those tax advantaged vehicles. And the other thing I realized was companies are really shitty at giving away money. And, and I felt like that was unfortunate because they, they have a lot of money to give away. There's an increasing expectation that they do give it away. And I felt as though if companies were better at giving it away, meaning like they were actually getting some value in return, which they all want, they just want to admit it, then it will make their giving more sustainable, right? Because they can justify it in their business outcomes. And so I guess all of these things kind of came together. And I'm like, all right, well, how do I solve all these problems? And, and this this idea for Groundswell came out. It's it's exciting. We we raised uh, some venture capital money last year, led by Google Ventures, and um, you know we're, we've built a great team. We've got some great early customers, and we're you know we're hooking and jabbing. Man, is is this something that individuals can go participate in? For yes. just for companies. Well, so our primary business model is with companies, but anybody can go and download the Groundswell app and Android and iOS, and they can create their own donor advised fund in 30 seconds. And that's and that's really cool. Again, like nobody's had access to that before. Um, and so I'm really proud of the fact that we've, you know, the, from our perspective, we've built the world's most modern and accessible donor advised fund. It's basically like having your own personal foundation. Um so yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's been a wild ride. I'm learning a ton. Man, and, and sorry, just to stay on this, when you have 
I don't, I have not heard of those either, a donor advised fund, right? So you have- Because you're not rich. Right, maybe, there you maybe, go. Maybe you're rich and I don't know. I've been, no, I mean, I, I work in Silicon Valley. So you would think like you, this would come up. I've worked at big tech companies, but I guess does if an individual sets that up, are they then trying to figure out where that money goes? Like to which charitable giving type organization? Yeah, so basically with a donor advised fund, you can put a lot of money into that account and, um, or it doesn't have to be a lot, but you can put money into that account and take an immediate tax deduction, but wait to give it to charity, right? And, and while it's in there waiting to be sent to charity, you can actually invest it for tax-free growth, just like a 401k grows tax-free. So that means, if, you know, let's say you want to like reduce your taxable income this year, you put $10,000 into your donor advised fund, you invest it. Next summer, it's worth $15,000. And at that point, even though you took the $10,000 deduction the prior year, now you're sending $15,000 to charity the following year and you're not having to pay Got capital gains tax on it. Yeah, this is how rich people give their money away. But again, like, you know, Joe's like you and me never had access to those accounts because we're not rich. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. All right. So, two questions and I'll get you out of here. These are two that I ask everybody at the end of our interviews. One is, is there anything that you carried with you when you were in combat that had sentimental value, good luck charm, or something that somebody had given you that you always wanted to have with you? Yeah. So every every Marine sniper is given a hog's tooth when they graduate sniper school. Um, it's kind of like a legendary um, token. It's basically just a 308 round on a on parachute cord that you wear around your neck. And um, the the, I don't know, the, the legend or whatever you want to call it with the hog's tooth, you know, the, the, the philosophy in the sniper community is that there's a, there's a bullet meant for everyone on this earth, right? So you got every, every, every one of your enemies, you're carrying a bullet that has their name on it, which means that they have a bullet that's carrying, that's got your name on it. And so like the, the legend is that the hog's tooth is that bullet, uh, your bullet. So as long as you have it, like you can't, nobody can get you. So you never take it off. You know, it's just kind of like one of those good luck charms. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I I took mine off my last day in the Marine Corps because um, nobody was hopefully trying to kill me anymore. And as good as it felt to wear it every single day where I was overseas, it felt really good to take off. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. You keep it nearby. Yeah, it, it it hangs in my closet um, right next to where like I keep like my wallet and some other things. And so I, I see it every day. Yeah. Um, so it's a reminder that maybe somebody's trying to kill me. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, you're not that. going to garden spots with Rubicon, I'm sure. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was good to take off. And then the last question here that I ask everybody is kind of looking back at some of those really difficult times that you went through and losing people the way you did, like dodging two IEDs and then watching somebody get hit with one and all the the near misses looking back on that would you go back and do that again yeah absolutely um you know war is awful but it was also formative um and i think you know i don't i don't lust for combat i think some people do um i don't sometimes i miss it right um, but it, it certainly gave me a perspective on the world and on my life. Um, you know, you can ask at what cost, and that's a fair question to ask, but, um, I mean, at the end of the day, my country needed me to serve and I did, and I'm proud of that because not everybody made that same choice. We can question, I think whether they were the right, you know, one of the, you know, Iraq was the right war to fight or not. Nonetheless, like, you know, we were fighting it and, you know, you, me, we raised our right hand to do it. Um, so yeah, I would do it again, but I, I, like, I think we led with, I, I also look back with newfound respect on the people that were protesting it. Yeah. And there is just one other thing. When we mentioned the Pat Tillman award that you got at the ESPYs, um, I imagine it was pretty tough to to receive that on screen, um, preparing for that. What was going through your mind as as you kind of got that or knowing the history with Pat Tillman and, and similar background you all had? Um, well, accepting it in front of a live TV audience, the <laughs> primary thing going through my head was don't screw this up. 
<laughs> but uh, listen, I think it was it was certainly surreal. It was, um, you know, I don't think I'll ever have half the courage that Pat Tillman had. Um, but I feel as if you know, if I could demonstrate half, then I'm I'm doing okay. So I, I think I, I I set up there. Glad that his death provided my life some level of meaning, but also knowing that like I could never have been half the person that he was. So I mean, I think it was just another one of those humbling moments. Yeah, man, Jake, thanks so much uh, for the time for for sharing some of these insights. I know they're tough, um, and for what you're doing now uh, with Rubicon and, and Groundswell, I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Ryan. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. It's hard not to uh, to enjoy Jake's <laughs> Jake's background. It makes me feel so lazy with all that he has going on. If you did enjoy it, I hope that you can leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your your podcasts, or leave us a comment on YouTube. It helps other people find these. And if you're on YouTube, please like and subscribe to this. Um, it helps us build up this brand and gets these incredible stories to more people. For those who have already subscribed, thank you. Here are some listener comments this week. The first one is an Apple podcast five-star review. It's from a name I just looks like letters typed in, E-R-D-F-H-H-U-H. But it says, great show as always. Thanks for what you're doing. And it's a five-star review. That, again, helps get us in front of more people to hear the stories of these um, these veterans that really should be told. Then there's a comment, two comments here from the Rick Prado interview. One is from Raleigh Marlin. says, awesome interview, Ryan. Thanks, Rick, for your service to this country. I have a whole new respect for the work the CIA does. Um, I, I wanted to use this one in particular. First of all, thank you for leaving it. And also, it brings up something where I didn't realize, because I've, I've just grown up around the agency, the CIA, the embassy environment, my dad being in State Department and military. And I grew up in the military too. So like, I, I was always around these organizations and I didn't realize how differently people look at the military and the agency. To me, they are one in the same. The people who choose to make almost no money go wherever the government tells them, put themselves in harm's way, put their families second for so many years, at great risk. I know people who have been shot, stabbed, um, PTSD from the agency. And I just didn't realize the way that people think of the work that goes on at the CIA as possibly being malicious um, and somewhat different from the military. So maybe maybe it's just because I, I grew up in that environment, but I, I now am on a quest to educate people on the work that the men and women at the agency do and to shed light on the fact that it is really difficult. And I put it up there with the work that the military does. Like you are out on your own. I'm not diminishing the work of the soldiers out there by any means. I love my time there. And maybe you're in harm's way more, but there are people at the agency who are out doing things that you cannot imagine for each of us to sleep soundly at night. So I just, uh, I'm glad to hear that you left that rally. Thank you very much for sharing that. It means a lot to me. The other one on the Rick Prado interview, <laughs> this is a great one. This is from Pat Duffy, also a YouTube comment. It says, thank you, Ryan, for bringing these outstanding guests on. Rick is a treasure trove of information. I've seen all your videos so far, but when I saw the thumbnail of a Browning high power, a Walter PPK, double-edged dagger, and most importantly, the Dutch V40 mini frag. I knew this podcast was going to be hot. Nice work, Ryan and Rick. That's so great to hear. I think that's what I love so much about this audience. Um, I mean, if you take your time to listen to these stories, there's something about what we hear, the, the tools of the trade, for lack of a better term, that really interest us. So I, I really was just cracking up as I read that, Pat. Thank you for sharing it. And then the last one uh, was another YouTube comment from Bart Gallant on uh, Remy Adeleke. He says, this is a priceless interview. Remy's life is a triumph of the human spirit. Just incredible. <laughs> then Bart goes on to rightfully call out, is there a way we can kind of adjust the audio, which I completely get sometimes. Um, we can do better there. We will try to in the future. But just said, regardless, an incredible interview. Um, and the three comments featured at the end of that interview, he says, were spot on. 
The videos all deserve a deep reflection. Thanks for this work. So moving. Uh, Bart is a longtime listener and supporter. Thank you, Bart, for supporting me and the program and these veterans throughout. Um, I just I just get so energized coming out of these interviews. I'm sure you can tell as I read these comments. I always do them at the end of an interview. Um, so I'm usually pretty charged about it. But thank you for the support you give to me and, and to these veterans, to all of you listening out there. Thank you and stay safe, y'all.